So what comes to mind? We're going to have a pop quiz. What comes to mind when you think of the word perfect? Just shout it out. God. You've got to shout louder than that. God. God. Jesus. Jesus. Those are, those are very Sunday school answers, people. Let's think outside of the box. 100%. Impossible. What? Angelina Jolie. That is very outside of the box, Ruby. I like you. Any others? Can you think of anything else? What comes to mind? Dogs? That one you're going to have to explain to me. Babies. Oh, that's a good one. Though babies and daylight savings time is not perfect. So a friend of mine uh, from seminary, her name is Emily, um, for Lent two years ago, um, started giving up trying to be a perfectionist. It has become this movement with its own hashtag um, called Lent Unedited. And so she posts things. So I, I wrote her last night to ask her to give me a description of it instead of trying to give you my interpretation of what she's doing. So this is what she said. I am a recovering perfectionist, and last Lent, um, Hopi Jernigan Wells came up with the idea, inspired by Brene's Brown book, Gifts of Imperfection, among other things, to start the hashtag Lent Unedited. This would be a chance for us to post on what our lives were really like, not the cleaned up versions we often post. I have found that this year I have posted more on friendships and motherhood as I have found great joy in these areas. I realize sometimes my perfectionism or the messages I tell myself of how things should look get in the way of embracing the blessings in my life. I wanted to share with you just a few of my favorite of her Lent unedited posts. All of these are from this year. Um, last week's was, I was in my pajamas by 5 p.m. today. I thought that was brilliant. I wanted to be in my, it was, I think it was a Saturday if I remember. She said on another one, I thought when I stopped working full time my house would be cleaner. Nope. Sometimes I willingly let the dog chew up toys, less clutter, and I don't have to take responsibility for finding a new home for them. She has a three-year-old. My daughter had M&Ms for breakfast. At least they were peanut with some added protein. That post made Emily my hero. This is her last one. Three-year-old tantrums are plain hard. I remember when she was a baby, I could escape to another room or outside while she screamed, but now she follows me around, wiping snot on me as she whines and cries, sometimes for like an hour. I am comforted by the fact that like a bad movie, they will eventually come to an end. Lent unedited. For the past four weeks, we've been looking at hard sayings of Jesus. And really, I think if we try to live them out, most things that Jesus said are hard. But there are some of them that, especially on the first hearing, can be especially difficult. Some that seem not to make sense, and some which can even feel contradictory to other things that Jesus has said. There are some things that when we are really honest with ourselves, we wish Jesus hadn't said because they're just too hard. These are the things that we've been taking the time to wrestle with, the things that, rather than avoiding, we have been addressing head-on during this Lent, seeking to discern what Jesus is really saying and how we are called to live in response to them. So we began by um, examining Jesus' call to hate our families. He said, I came that you might hate your father and mother, and how Jesus wasn't saying that we should hate our family. Instead, he was reminding us all that we will have to give all that we will have to give up to be his disciples, that everything, even our family, must come second to being a disciple of Christ. We reflected on Jesus' words to the rich ruler and Jesus' admonition to sell everything we have and follow him. We learn that what is impossible for humans is possible for God. We studied Jesus' hard words on divorce and adultery, words that have been used for years to hurt or shame people who have experienced divorce. And we talked about how Jesus was lifting up the original intent of marriage, the good gift but hard work that is marriage. And last week, we took a step back and looked at several hard sayings from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' hard words that call us to let go of anger and seek reconciliation and view others as children of God rather than objects to be used, to remove anything that causes a sin. Remember, he told us we were to pluck out our eyes. 
and that um, to be truth tellers, we're called to live lives of integrity instead. So as we look at these difficult sayings of Jesus, you might have sensed a little bit of a pattern, and we have in fact repeated passages so that we could use just a section of them. All of these passages, including today's, lift up to us the cost of discipleship. Time and time again, Jesus tells us that being his disciple is difficult, that it will cost us something. Often, the things we hold most dear to us, our families, our wealth, our desire to be right, to cling to the wrong that has been done to us, our selfish nature of wanting our own needs met without regard for how that affects other people, even our inclination to bend the truth, to give false or misleading information, all of that has to be given up if we want to be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. So we come to our passage this morning that is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, and we end with the very last piece that he says, be perfect, therefore, as my Father in heaven is perfect. How many of you, I wonder, are the oldest sibling or an only child? If you're one of those, raise your hand. Wow, we have a lot. That's amazing. So statistically, you people, I am not one of you, are more likely to struggle with perfectionism. So if you want to be really brave, raise, raise your hand if you are either a perfectionist or a recovering perfectionist. You don't have to be an, an only or oldest. That was a little less, because I think some of you might be lying. <laughs> Culturally, especially in the last decade, we prize perfectionism. Steve Jobs and Martha Stewart are frequently credited with insisting that their teams strive for that word, perfection. Of course, we all know that perfectionism has its benefits, right? Especially in work, where it motivates overachievers to pursue high standards and new visions. There are good things that perfectionists bring. They are driven to improve and innovate. They can be disciplined and detail-oriented, both of which are critical in professions where there is no margin for error. Like, I want my surgeon to be a perfectionist, right? If you're going into surgery, you want an oldest child, perfect person. But there are also bad sides to striving for perfectionism. And we don't usually talk about the impact of working with the control freak or the collateral damage to creativity that can come with striving so hard for perfection. Perfectionism is linked to depression, anxiety disorders, anorexia, obsessive compulsive disorder, to insomnia. Studies have also linked perfectionism to relationship problems. If you tend to be a perfectionist and your spouse is not, that can be a problem, or sometimes if both of you are, but you have a different idea of what perfectionism looks like, that can be tough. While setting high standards can serve as an effective motivational tool, expecting yourself to be perfect can take joy out of your life and can actually, in the end, limit your greatest potential for success. Multiple studies have shown the correlation between perfectionism and unhappiness. Because try as we might, it simply isn't human to be perfect, certainly not all of the time. The problem arises when perfectionists take things too far. And all of us, even if you're not maybe a habitual perfectionist, we all have done this at times in our lives. You set standards that are impossible to meet and then devalue the work that doesn't meet the impossible standards. It becomes a toxic loop. I was watching a TED Talk this week um, for those of you who are on my Facebook, I posted it on there. It's an excellent TED Talk. Um, and it was a woman who was talking about um, how we need to be teaching our children, uh, especially our girls, instead of teaching them to be perfect, we need to teach them how to be brave because we tend to teach our boys to be brave and to prize that in boys, but we tend to encourage our, our girls to be perfect. And uh, she was talking about how she and some friends had started an organization that teach, g teaches girls specifically to code, to do computer codes. And she said they noticed in the first couple of years that they were doing this, different behavior um, in how the girls would ask for help. So she said uh, a girl would call the teacher over and her screen would be blank. There was no code on the screen. And she'd say to her teacher, I can't do it. I can't get it right. 
and it would be completely blank, but if you'd press the undo button a few times, the code would come up on the screen where she had completed it, almost finished it, but made a couple of mistakes and so had deleted the whole thing because she would rather show a blank screen to her teacher than show the mistakes that she had made in trying to make the code. We strive for perfectionism and when it doesn't happen, we can become embarrassed and get into this toxic loop where we don't think we're good enough because of the mistakes that we have made. A researcher says it this way, given the desire to be valued and appreciated, it's tempting to try to appear to be perfect, but the costs of such deceptions are high. How can you like yourself when you don't measure up the way that you ought to be? There was a study done by um, a woman with the last name of Fry and her colleagues who looked at the relationship between perfectionism and the overall risk of death. The study followed 450 adults aged 65 and older for six and a half years. The participants completed an initial questionnaire to assess their level of perfectionism and some other personality traits. Traits And those with high perfectionism scores, meaning that they placed high expectations on themselves to be perfect, had a 51% increased risk of death compared to those with low scores. 51% increased risk of death. The researchers suspect that high levels of stress and anxiety, which are known to be linked with perfectionism, might contribute to the decrease in lifespan. So... We come to this saying, Jesus says, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. So what do we do with that when we know that perfectionism has an increased risk of 51% lower lifespan? What is Jesus asking us to do? Well, when we hear that kind of command, most of us hear it as an injunction to a kind of moral perfectionism, that we are to be without sin, to be perfect, to make no mistakes. But that's not actually what the original language implies. In this case, the word used, perfect, comes from a Greek word who it, it, which is better translated as goal or end or purpose or even complete. The sense of the word is more about becoming what was intended, accomplishing one's God-given purpose in the same way that God constantly reflects God's own nature and purpose. It doesn't mean to be sinless because Jesus knew that we could not be sinless. Maybe it makes more sense to think of this word perfection as purpose, so that there is a sense of movement, of becoming what God's in, God intends, of accomplishing our God-given purpose in the same way that God reflects God's own nature and purpose. Eugene Peterson, who um, made the, um, the message, which is a modern day translation of scripture, he translates this verse a little differently. He says, you are kingdom subjects, now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. That's what Jesus is saying when he tells us to be perfect. But we also have to remember who is saying this in the first place. It's Jesus. The one who not only talked the talk of love, but walked the walk, who tread steadfastly to Jerusalem, enduring the shame and humiliation of the cross, embracing death itself, all so that we might know and experience and trust just how much God loves us, and so that we might have abundant life. It's the same Jesus who later in the Gospel of Matthew will tell the disciples that one of them will betray him. The same Jude Jesus who loved Judas and Peter, even though he knew that one would betray him and one would deny him. And yet he called them to be perfect. I think when we hear it, we have to hear it not as a condemnation, not as a checklist for us to check ourselves against, but rather as a call to continually try to be more than we are. In the Methodist Church, of course, our founder is John Wesley. And John Wesley believed in, um, and taught a different way to think about grace 
than people did in his day and age. And we've talked about that a little bit before, the idea that God's grace goes before us before we even know it, which he named as provenient grace, that we experience God's justifying grace when we come into a relationship with Christ, when we believe that he died and was risen again for our sakes, and that we experience God's sanctifying grace, that is the grace that continues to make more of us than we are as we walk in faith day by day. Wesley also believed that we were going on to perfection. And if, and if you go to any Methodist ordination anywhere in the world, which will happen in most places sometime between May and July of this year, you will hear the same set of historical questions that um, John, I almost said Jesus, John Wesley is not Jesus. Sometimes we get that confused in our head. But that John asked um, his original people that he ordained into the Methodist Church. And one of those questions is, are you going on to perfection, and do you believe that you can reach perfection in this life? And the right answer to both of those questions, if you want to be ordained, is yes. Which seems kind of hard. It's hard for us to imagine that we can go on to perfection in this life. Wesley really believed that we could attain it, but he knew that in this passage and in others like it, Jesus wasn't asking us to be perfect or sinless. When John Wesley talks about perfection, he talks about it in terms of love, that we are to strive for perfection in the area of love, that we are to look at people the way that Jesus looked at people that we are to follow the set of commands that come before this, to love our enemy and to pray for those who persecute us, that was his idea of what it meant to be perfect. Jesus not only commands us to perfect, he also understands. He understands just how hard it is for us to love rather than hate, to forgive rather than begrudge, to embrace rather than protect, to share rather than hoard, to heal rather than wound, especially when we ourselves walk so much of our lives wounded and hurt. As we listen to his words today, it seems to me that the perfect Jesus speaks of now is the perfection that is attained in the midst of the rough and tumble life that we leave, where we may be beaten and robbed in any number of ways, and where we have lived long enough and fully enough to make some enemies of our own. This perfect, I think, is ours to attain only after we have been bruised by the world and after we have bruised others. This perfect is achieved when we give more than what is asked for and when we love even in the face of hate and can only be achieved moment by moment. It is not something that is done in any one way. Each person's perfect is going to look a little different because we all love a little differently. It's not like counting one to a hundred where you either do it the right or the wrong way. And it is something that can always, always be done better. Your perfect today might look different than your perfect in 10 years. And it is not something I'm quite certain will ever get completely right. The goal of being like God is. It will always be a little bit just beyond our reach unless we let God do the work through us. St. Augustine had a saying that he would say each time to his congregants while presiding at the Lord's Supper. He said to them before they came, receive who you are, become what you've received. He was talking about the body of Christ. Receive who you are, become what you've received. I read a story this week of a crooked prince. He's an African prince, and he uh, was born a hunchback. And at 13, his father, the king, came to him and said, what do, you, what do you want for your birthday? And the prince said, I want a statue of myself. And the father thought that that was kind of ridiculous because why would you want a statue of yourself when he looked like he looked? But the prince was adamant and he said, I don't want a statue that looks like I am now. I want a statue of me standing straight and tall and looking good. So the king had people make this statue and they placed it right outside of the window of the prince's room where he would have to look at it every day. And for eight years, that prince, every day, would go out and stand beside the statue and spend time looking at it and try to change his body to look like the statue. For eight years, every day. 
until his 21st birthday. He went out and he stood next to the, to the statue with his shoulders erect and his head straight, staring eyeball to eyeball with the bronze image of himself. The story ends with these words, whither thou seest, thou will beest. What you see, you will be. I think it's an amazing story to tell us about what we need to do if we want to be perfect as our Father is perfect. We have to keep the image of God in which we are created forefront in our minds. We have to look at it every day, to read the words of scripture every day that tell us what it looks like to be perfect, to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, to go the extra mile when you're asked to do something. Whither thou seest, thou will beest. May we all strive to be more like Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.